I'm going to start recording. Thank okay. you everyone for coming. All right, so let me just find my screen. Okay, so this is your sale. Where are you from if you want to? Yes, I will. Um, so, uh, okay, so hopefully everyone can see the screen. Um, and yeah, I'm wearing my pajamas here. It's uh, 1037 here. I'm in uh, New York City. And um, yeah, we're going to be talking about embracing the pivot today and basically just, um, you know, UX is, is something that a lot of people transition into. Um, I think that, you know, five, 10 years ago, it wasn't really something you could major in in school or, you know, really study to become. Um, there were ways to get into it, like through art school and things like that. Um, but that was even more for someone like a, a graphic designer and, and a little bit less for a UX designer. Um, so what I'll be talking about today is basically what I did and uh, what I do see a lot um, because now I, I do teach UX as well. And um, there seems to be a lot of common trends, I would say, with um, a lot of, uh, you know, students transitioning or um, people that are, you know, well into their careers and then trying to tr transition. So I think it is a topic that um, a lot of people uh, do kind of, um, you know, fall into a similar category. Um, and I will uh, share these slides a little bit later. Um, I'll just share them in, in the chat here or even the Discord channel. So um, so you guys could definitely look through because there are some links in it if you uh, would like to check those out. All right. Um, so, you know, this is very important. Before we start um, these slides today, they're brought to you by the letter T. Um, this is Big Bird. If you guys know Big Bird, then, you know, give a thumbs up because he's a, a really cool guy. Um, does anyone know who this is? Um, you know, put it in the chat or you could even say it out loud or something like that. Nope. Okay, all right, so this is uh, Jared Spool. He's uh, a very popular uh, person in the UX world. Um, he was a software developer back, you know, 40 years ago, 30 years ago. And he's the kind of person that's, um, I was listening to something that he was talking about one day and, and he was basically comparing his UX career to um, being on the beach. Uh, Fine, go, 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 let's go. Let's go, something, come, something. sit, go. There's, sorry, there's, there's, some, there's a dog going on. Yeah, so sorry, I'm going to unmute that person. Okay, Guys, no if you are, please unmute yourselves as soon as possible. All right, no worries. Um, but yeah, so uh, he basically compares his UX career to uh, being on a beach and getting to a beach like early in the morning and pulling out a book and basically just reading. And then two hours later, you look up from the book and you basically see that the beach is very crowded. Um, and that's kind of like his, his, like how he got into UX. Like he never actually sought out to get into UX. Um, it just kind of happened around him. And now he's a speaker at a bunch of events and he's just like a very, uh, popular guy uh, for, you know, even though he was part of the software world before. Um, he's actually, uh, he was uh, part of the team that um, designs the arrow keys on the keyboards. Um, so it's kind of like an inverse T. Um, I don't know, it, does, it doesn't really matter or anything, but I think that's kind of interesting that he's the guy that was part of that. Um, but basically in 2018 or maybe even before that, uh, he put out this Twitter message or tweet as the kids call him, and he got a lot. He got in trouble for this. Uh, a lot of people just basically uh, went after. They retweeted him, and they were basically just like, "This is ridiculous." Like, I'm a designer. I'm, you know, better than the normal person or whatever. Um, just because I, um, you know, put on a band aid, it doesn't make me a doctor. Or like, just because I turn in, uh, I screw in a light bulb, it doesn't make me an electrician. And um, Jared basically just went back to them, and he said. Um, you know, you're right. Um, but also a doctor, you know, goes to school, like for many, many years, he gets a certification, electrician is certified, things like that. Um, sometimes designers, like you can go to school to be a designer, and you can get certifications and things like that. But um, like, I never went to art school, I, I never went to school for design, I don't have any um, interesting sorts of like certifications, I basically just did some projects, and that got me started in design. Um, so that's kind of his point. Um, but I think that this is kind of a theme that is going to come up a little bit during this talk as well. Um, so, you know, if, if that's the case, if everyone's a designer, like everyone in a company could be a designer, what exactly is a UX designer then? Um, that's kind of like, you know, where do you kind of like 
what, what separates one person from another if everyone could be a, a designer. Um, so before I get there, uh, I haven't really uh, totally introduced myself, but um, so I'm John or Jonathan as, as Leticia mentioned. And um, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and I actually live there now still. And basically when I was going to school and after, even after I graduated for a long time, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. It was kind of just, you know, I was going through uh, different sorts of careers and kind of just figured like, maybe this is it, maybe this is it. Um, and then eventually I found UX. Um, and now it's kind of like, I'm at a realization that yes, this is what I do like to do. Um, I just didn't really know the path to it. Um, so I studied journalism back in school. Um, I then graduated and went to an ad agency. It was terrible. Um, it was so terrible that I decided to flee the country. And I went to South Korea to teach English, um, which is very different from an ad agency, I would say. And then um, I came home and uh, basically started working at startups, things like that, um, usually doing things related to writing, things to marketing, things like that. Um, and then I figured that I was looking at all these startups and I, and I saw that um, the people that were really uh, you know, experiencing the most success in startups were the people that were, um, you know, writing code and, you know, being able to dictate, you know, getting a higher salary and things like that. So I figured maybe I should learn how to code. Um, and, you know, this is a common trend. I think that coding is kind of like the in thing now. Um, so I uh, took a course uh, and, you know, did some uh, coding projects and things like that and became a, a, a JavaScript developer, um, which was good for a time. I did like uh, coding and things like that, but um, if you can't tell, I'm a pretty extroverted person. I like to talk to people and things like that. And, uh, you know, programming is, is great, but a way too much time is spent, you know, behind the keyboard, which kind of wasn't something I wanted to do. Um, then I had the, uh, you know, good fortune of, uh, you know, someone reaching out to me, um, someone that I went to school with back, uh, back in high school, actually. And uh, this person basically said, hey, I'm starting a company and I'm looking for a developer. Um, so at the time I was working at another job, but I figured that it would be kind of a cool idea to, you know, help him out and, um, you know, get more experience as a developer. Um, and because it was such a small company, I was able to do this thing, which was user research, but I didn't even know what that was. Um, but from there, I basically decided that, you know, developing is okay and programming is okay, but I actually kind of like the discovery process and actually, you know, talking to users and trying to figure out designs uh, for features and things like that, that they would actually like. Um, and then since then I was basically, you know, working in UX and even now I'm working in UX. And I also do a bunch of like teaching and mentoring things um, at Thinkful, which is a coding school and uh, the IDF, which is uh, also kind of like a big, a big deal uh, design uh, foundation. Okay. Does anyone know who this guy is? Okay. All right. Cool. Okay. All right. So this um, obviously is Steve Jobs and um, he doesn't, uh, you know, he doesn't have too much to do with my talk, but um, I did. Uh, and I have a link to this in the, in the slide so you guys can check it out. But he did give this talk in 2005 at Stanford and um, you know, it, it's a great talk, so you should just listen to the whole thing. It's, it's really inspiring and all that kind of stuff. But one real quote definitely stood out to me, especially when I look back on all of the different um, um, pit stops I made during my career to get to where I am now. Um, so he basically talks about, um, you know, you can't really connect dots looking forward. You know, you, you basically have to get through everything and then look backwards. And I think that that's very important, especially when you are, um, you know, trying to break into something new and, you know, figure out how you could use your present skills um, to, you know, get to the next, the next place. Like you always have to kind of uh, look into your past and look into the things that you have learned that you might know and maybe the next person doesn't. All right. Um, so connecting the dots backwards, um, I already mentioned this, but UX is um, you know, it's, it's a career that didn't really exist 10, 15 years ago. I mean, I guess, yes, it did, but um, it kind of only has grown exponentially in the past, you know, few. And that trend is going to continue for sure. Um, but I, I think that like 10, 
uh, you know, five to 10 years from now, there will be kids and, you know, students that, that graduate that may have, you know, the knowledge of UX beforehand. But as of right now, there are a ton of people that are basically coming from different disciplines, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, yeah, and, and basically there really isn't one trajectory that people follow. Um, so you can come from things like graphic design, which makes sense, psychology, which makes sense for like the user research side of things. Um, architecture is, you know, another type of design. So uh, it, it, it um, you know, designing a house versus designing a website is not actually that different. Um, another thing is hospitality. Um, I think that, you know, serving people at a hotel, for example, is very, uh, there's obviously differences, but it's very similar in some ways to, uh, you know, serving users on a website um, or some sort of product. And obviously computer science is another one because you're always going to be working with let's say the development team or engineering or something like that. Um, okay. And you know, wherever you do come from, you're always going to be kind of a master of something. Um, it really depends on the person that you are to kind of figure out what you are a master of. Like maybe you spent, you know, 20 years in, you know, some job and uh, you have solved problems in that job. So uh, you can get uh, basically knowledge from that job to pivot you into UX. Um, so I do have um, a student who will, we will call Mary for now. And I was talking to her uh, a week or two ago. And um, basically Mary is, is someone that is trying to transition into UX. And she is a business owner. She owns a massage and wellness studio. And uh, I, she was talking to me and she was basically just like, you know, I don't really understand. Like you had it so easy, like your transition was so easy, but I don't know, I don't know Figma. I don't know Sketch and all this other stuff. And I just... I, I think that she kind of missed like the whole point of this and that, um, you know, I, I think when you read a job description, for example, uh, you kind of assume that the most important skill that you could have is basically, can I make a prototype? Can I do sketch? Can I do XD or something like that? Um, but that's not actually the case. And the case is more, are you able to solve problems? Um, and Mary, she obviously handles clients and solves problems and she does this kind of things. Um, so I basically just had to kind of, you know, help her out and try to understand that. Um, because I think that for her, it was more a, a hurdle that she didn't really understand that she, that she didn't have. And it was more just imposter syndrome that she didn't really see herself as a designer. Um, and, you know, if we go back to Jared's school in the first slide, like when he says that everyone's a designer, I think that, you know, having that, that sort of mindset that you actually can do um, design without even, you know, ever touching Figma in the first place. Like design doesn't start when you're, um, you know, sitting in front of the screen trying to make a prototype. Design starts way before that when you're trying to understand a problem that someone's having. Okay. And this is our friend Big Bird again. Um, but the truth is he wasn't the only reason I brought up the letter T. Um, the letter T is actually pretty important to this, uh, to this talk. Um, we're going to talk about being a T-shaped person and I'm not, entirely sure if, if you guys have heard about this concept, but it's pretty important, I would say, um, especially since hiring is very competitive right now, um, especially the fact that uh, if hiring is going to be very virtual in the near or even distant future, um, you really do have to figure out ways to kind of stand out among other people. Um, so basically the, the way that this T works is that uh, there are three types of people, and the first type is the dash types person, which is basically someone that knows a lot of, um, you know, a, a, like a, a jack of all trades, basically, as it says here, um, or a person that basically just has broad knowledge in a lot of different topics. Um, you know, this person is, you know, it, he's useful, he, he or she is useful, but at the same time, when you're applying to a job, for example, uh, if someone is looking for, you know, someone that knows Figma, for example, or someone that knows how to do user research or uh, make illustrations, it's kind of like if your knowledge is that broad, you probably wouldn't be able to do something like that. Um, then there's the I-shaped person, which is uh, kind of the opposite of that. It's basically someone that has one skill and it's one skill that they could do really, really well. And um, this is... Uh, pretty good when applying to jobs, but you are very limited in the number of jobs that you can actually apply for. Um, so you'll notice that some people, when they are making their portfolios and, and doing things like that, 
um, they specifically call themselves something that is extremely, extremely specific. So like user researcher or, uh, you know, like uh, motion graphic designer or something like that. Um, if someone is a motion graphic designer, for example, then they wouldn't be able to apply for a job that is, you know, a uh, something else that, that is related to, in, in the same field. Um, so you have to kind of like balance those two and become someone who is a T-shaped person that has uh, a broad uh, type of, uh, you know, many different types of broad knowledge, um, but then also specifies in something in, in a little bit more depth. Um, so Don Norman is uh, another big time design guy. He's uh, the Norman in the NNG down there. And he also wrote a couple books, actually more than a couple, but there's a couple here. The uh, Design of Everyday Things is the one that uh, people usually reference. And um, I bring him up because uh, yeah, he also invented the term user experience a bit. And he held a workshop uh, basically last week uh, with the IDF. And um, he said, I, I, I basically, like I didn't even get this until uh, I was actually looking at Instagram and I screenshotted someone that actually watched it. Um, and I thought that this was kind of interesting, but um, basically the, the quote here is that designers must learn other languages in order to uh, be listened to and make bigger impact. Um, so basically, in order to be a better designer, you have to learn marketing, finance, and strategy, and things like that. And this makes sense because, you know, when you are, let's say, making a portfolio, that is a marketing assignment. You're trying to market yourself as a candidate for, uh, you know, some sort of job or whatever. Um, so I think that, like, um, this is, is, is kind of interesting because we have one person, Don Norman, who basically says that designers shouldn't stop at design. They should actually go further and actually uh, learn other things like, like you know, marketing and, and strategy, branding, things like that. And then we have the other guy, Jared Spool, who's basically saying that everyone is, is a designer. Um, so these two are kind of opposites, but at the same time, they're both right. Um, I think these, these are two you know, very uh, prominent people in, in the world of design and in the world of UX design. Um, but basically, I think that both of these men are basically uh, saying that everyone should be a T-shaped person. Um, everyone should have, you know, broad disciplines that they understand. And if you are a designer, you should understand what the development team is doing. It doesn't necessarily mean that you should learn JavaScript, but you should kind of understand uh, their process and how their team is, is structured and, and who does what, what is front end, what is back end, things like that. And at the same time, you know, maybe even you know, find out what sales does. How does the sales team or how, yeah, how do the salespeople on your, in your company maybe uh, like sell the product or, um, you know, speak about the product to someone who is external or something like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like, I think that that is very important and both of these guys have a point. Um, so planting your flag. If we were to go back to my history, um, and you know, when I was first starting in UX design, um, let's see the skills that I had. Um, I basically had came from a journalism background, so I had some experience with interviewing and writing, things like that. Um, I had some teaching experience since I you know, taught for uh, a good amount of time. Um, I had coding experience because I was a developer, and I had some advertising experience because I worked at an ad agency, um, and I did some marketing. Um, so this is basically my broad, uh, this is my, my eye, uh, horizontal line. And, you know, starting out, I basically just needed to find a T. I I needed things to dig into. Um, and this is basically what happened. I basically learned about UX research. I learned about prototyping tools, visual design, mentorship, things like that, that I wanted to basically focus on, um, to kind of understand UX. And this is just the start. Um, like now, you know, a couple few years later, things like that, I could basically take one of these disciplines and go even further and make a new T. Um, so let's say if I wanted to, you know, continue with something like mentorship or whatever, um, maybe I want to write a, a UX course or something like that. Um, so then I can make a brand new T with the new skills that I have and things like that. Um, so the T can always get more specific, um, but I think it's kind of a good exercise to kind of understand what, um, uh, skills that you have that you could kind of bring to the table basically um, and also I use this term planting your flag on the top and I just want to mention this book uh, it just actually came out um, Jeff Gottelf is the guy who wrote Lean UX which is a popular UX book um, but basically he talks about um, the fact that if if you do kind of want to be you know noticeable when 
you know, people are thinking of like, who should we hire, things like that. Um, it's not enough to basically just kind of apply blindly. Like you basically have to have, you have to brand yourself as someone that is, you know, this is the guy that's really good at illustration, or this is the person that um, can really do user research really well. Like you, you basically have to do something like that. So I would definitely recommend um, just checking out, you know, the, uh, this book or, you know, a talk by Jeff Gothel or something like that. And also, I just want to mention this podcast. Um, I didn't mention this before, but when I was going through basically my history of like what I've done and things like that, um, the guy who hosts this uh, podcast, his name is um, Jason Ogle or something. Um, he mentions that uh, like whenever he brings a guest on to his podcast, he basically goes through their origin story and he kind of has this theme of like, like they're superhero, like user defenders are, are like UX people are, are superheroes that, um, uh, you know, fight for the user and stuff like that. And I think it's really corny, but I do think that it is kind of interesting that he takes the time to go through people's history. Um, and you get to see that, you know, UX people sometimes start out in very different places. Um, and I think that that's, that's kind of important that they brought their knowledge from a different uh, discipline into, you know, the UX world. Um, so now I have three different uh, um, uh, three different uh, portfolios that I do want to mention here. Um, and, you know, all three of these portfolios are interesting um, because all of them kind of go into that origin story thing, which I think is uh, more of a selling point uh, than, you know, just saying like, I'm a designer, I know Figma or something like that. Um, so, you know, if we were just go through, go through them one by one, this guy, Carl, um, I think that, you know, something important that he does mention is that he has an academic background, for example, and it kind of, you know, stands out that this is a guy that knows psychology, you know, that that's something good. Like there's a lot of stuff to hear that, you know, he is a user researcher and he is a psychology person. Um, so if I'm, you know, if I hear about a job that needs someone that is, you know, looking for user research and stuff like that, this is the kind of person that I would look for. Um, he also has a PhD, which is pretty cool. Um, the next person is Amy. Um, Amy is a, another Queens person or another uh, New York person. And the, the thing that I love about this portfolio is that the last sentence in another life, uh, she designed picture books and young adult novels at Penguin. Like that's kind of something that speaks to like the human being and, and not so much, um, you know, uh, you know, she's not just another designer. She's basically someone that's, uh, she lists the things that she did and then she finishes up with something that's, you know, completely not even related to UX. Uh, I guess it is kind of design, but it's not really too much of a UX, but I think that that's pretty powerful. Um, and the last guy, I found him from uh, uh, the Flux uh, YouTube channel with Ron Segal, but basically um, this is a person that works a lot with nonprofits, as you can see here, nonprofits, and he tutors uh, with Career Foundry and he, is working with the global goals curriculum. So this is really all really important stuff. And what all three of these people have in common is they basically give you, um, you know, their, uh, basically their origin story, their, their, um, like what kind of brought them to design. Um, so the most important skills as, as a designer, um, is it something like fig sketch, sketch or XD? Absolutely not. Um, like none of these designers actually mention the fact that they like their toolbox, um, toolboxes come and go. Um, like in five years, are we really going to be using Figma, Sketch, or XD? Like that, it might, we might be, but um, there's a possibility that another tool uh, might come around and, and change that or something like that. So um, successful designers understand the ability to relate to a person. Like that's, that's basically the goal of a designer. Like you're trying to uh, listen more than you're talking. And, you know, when you are, you know, trying to figure out a problem and define a problem, um, you're basically just trying to, uh, you know, listen to a person and empathize with them and then, um, you know, try to solve from there. Um, you know, the double design method is something that I really like, but basically that is your goal. Your goal is not to design something that looks nice in a in prototyping stage, um, but it's basically, you know, your goal is to basically empathize with a person. Um, that's, you know, another reason why I put Big Bird in, you know, the earlier slides, because I figured that there might be a lot of you that kind of understand like who that is. And um, it's, it's kind of a storytelling technique. Um, stories really drive design. And uh, you can see from the, the portfolios that I put before. Um, and if, if there is a story to kind of, uh, you know, for some that someone would want to listen to, I think that that makes uh, a design even more powerful. Um, so the homework for you guys, if you haven't done this already, is to kind of figure out your own tea. 
and you know, kind of figure out what are your skills. You could put four, you could put 10, it doesn't really matter. Um, but basically use those as kind of a way to propel your, you forward and, you know, and then think about things that you want to work on in the future um, or now even. And, you know, just do that as a ways to, you know, uh, figure out a, a better way to market yourself and your portfolios and things like that. Um, and you know, the, the roadblock that always kind of, kind of com comes up is imposter syndrome. Um, but Jared Spool, basically, he also said that unofficial designers are essential for most organizations. Um, so with this in mind, it's kind of impossible to have imposter syndrome because if unofficial designers are essential to most organizations, then once again, like everyone's a designer. Um, so I have a, a medium article here that you could definitely read at your own leisure. Um, but yeah, so I will put these slides in the chat and I'll put it in Discord and stuff like that. So you guys can always reference this. Um, but that's basically it. That's the whole um, thing. And uh, I hope you guys like that. Nice, thank you. Thank you, it was amazing, it was really Great presentation. Oh, awesome. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Nice, it's good to know. So I think I, I, we will need to put in this course the template of that T shape so everybody can take out the that document and put and upload again in the discord what do you think jonathan yeah i think that's that's perfectly fine yeah yeah it's it's just a bunch of boxes too so it's like you know i, I did it in a slideshow or you know google slides or something like that so uh but i just put the presentation in the chat so if you guys want to see that Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, I we, we are going to need the request access. Give me the access so I can. Uh, oh yeah, sure. Get a screenshot. I can upload here, and everybody can can work on it. Okay, I'll do that. Uh... It could be really good for everybody to have a minute and put their their strengths, their skills, and what they want to improve right away, right? Let me know when you... I, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Well, well, are we starting the questions already or you are working on something, Jonathan? Uh, we could totally start the questions. That's, that's perfectly <laughs> fine. Yeah, thank you very much for your talk. I'm, I'm precisely in that uh, middle uh, tra career transition from a software developer to a UX designer. So um, I already found my T uh, profile, I would say. But my, my question is, uh, how do you market yourself uh, to the recruiters? Because I've seen many ads that it's, it's great if you have another background and you have other other things you can bring to the table from your previous previous experiences, uh, but I had this this concern like all the ads keep saying like a lot of tons of years of experience, and I'm not sure if they actually see that you you are uh, you can provide another profile to their companies. So I'm wondering what is the what is the best way to show your your previous experiences um, to the recruiters if they are not even considering your the, the, the resumes for example is there, is there like the cover letter or keep connecting with people on linkedin but i don't know this this marketing part is there is, is very difficult for me yeah and it's really hard to be honest like it it's 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 hard because um you know there's there's a high percentage of jobs that are only marketed online for example or the, the other way around like a very low percentage of jobs are marketed a lot online like i think something like 70 to 80 percent of jobs are gotten through networking so i think that you know doing events like this and just networking with a lot of people is a good way to to, to do that um i think that like the fact that everything is virtual right now probably makes it a little bit harder um but i think that's um one thing that you can definitely do to basically just like market yourself better even or just like even more so is just kind of like find new ways to get your work out there and um join onto like projects that uh maybe like volunteer projects like i know you guys were doing like the volunteer projects and things like that um because that gives you um things to put into your portfolios and things like that um i would say like on linkedin um i would definitely just 
uh, connect with as many recruiters as you can. And not even if you're looking for a job like, or, or looking for a specific job, I would just kind of connect with a lot of different recruiters and tell them your story like, hi, my name is X and I live here and I'm looking for this, this type of job. And even if something doesn't come their way, um, they could kind of talk to you in like a very human way. And then eventually what would happen is, you know, they'll talk to their friends, they'll talk to their recruiting friends and things like that. And maybe they'll think, oh, you know, um, Liz was looking for a job uh, at, at, at this thing in, in this city or whatever. Um, maybe, you know, this would be good for her or something like that. So I think that like, you know, networking really is your best friend um, because once you have the portfolio that looks great and stuff like that, you have to figure out ways to kind of get this in front of people too. And that's the harder part. Um, uh, I think that like, if your portfolio looks great, then you're halfway there. I think that the marketing is the hard part. Um, but I think that like, uh, you know, sending connections to, to, uh, recruiters and things like that is probably the best way to do it. Thank you. Liz, we have a question here. Do you, can, can you read? Here, yeah, sure. Okay. So, uh, the question is, as you're transitioning into UX, what is a good goal uh, for the size of a portfolio to share with a, with potential employers, quality over quantity considered. Uh, and then can you send a link? I did send the link, so that's taken care of. I, I hope so. Um, but yeah, I guess like the, the question about the portfolio, um, there really is no perfect portfolio. Um, I think that portfolio is more style than anything. It's kind of like, um, you know, can you, uh, you know, show off who you are? Uh, in a visual way and, and you know that sort of thing so you can put like flashy things and stuff like that but but the, the fact is like if it's if it's kind of a distracting portfolio you might not want to um, I think that in terms of quality over quantity you probably want at least two projects in there um, I would say the the sweet spot is like three to five I think um, and also it really depends on what kind of designer that you want to be so for example, if you are the kind of designer that wants to focus mostly on prototypes and you know, being very visual, then I would say, yeah, definitely have a portfolio, like an actual website. But I would say that one thing that, or tools that you could use are things like Behance or Dribbble. And that's a, you know, another way to kind of like look for jobs and stuff like that, to put your stuff on that sort of uh, platform and basically connect that way. Um, another uh, portfolio, uh, thing that I recently come across that I uh, never had anything on is UX folio and it's basically just a community of just like a bunch of UX uh, um, uh, Portfolios, which is great and it's a good way to kind of just connect with other UX people as well um, So I, I would I would assume I'm not really sure but I would assume that um, a lot of recruiters probably go there um, to find UX people specifically Okay, good Anyone has another? Oh, you're using question? it. Thanks. Nice. Yeah, yeah. He's. I. I know Liz is, is really happy with with UX portfolio. Um, it, it, they have some UX problems, but I hope they they will solve it soon. Every every UX has problem in UX actually, don't you think? <laughs> yeah, and. Everybody, everyone, or oh, someone has a question for John? You want to uh, raise your hand? You wanted to know. So we can pick one just in case to, to have a question. Let me see. Ivan, what do you think? Hello. That was really good. Um, How's I'm your actually, mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Uh, I'm actually um, transitioning as well. I worked in higher education for seven years, and I um, I was I was a recruiter, so I went overseas and I pretty much lived in Asia for half of the year for the past seven years. Um, so actually, kind of going off by what everyone was what we were talking about. Um, I actually have my first freelance job coming up now. It's not UX related very much so at all. Um, but basically through Instagram, someone's a friend of mine saw some of the stuff that I had just posted 
and uh, she works at, at a university here too in, in New Jersey. And basically she said, hey, we're, we have this new program and we want a guide be, to be made. Would you make this guide for us? And they're like, can you just show us what you can do? And I just showed them what I can do. And now I'm hired with them um, you know, on a freelance type of situation to just help you know, design their guides <laughs> for HR. Uh, which is pretty cool. So it's not really a UX job, but um, it was cool to see that my stuff, something that was that I put out there, was seen by a, a friend and you know got me something. So yes, it's not going to be a UX position, but it's still something that I would probably put down as you know something design, probably visual design or instructional design of sorts, um, so that you know it shows that I have something extra there too. So I'm actually really excited. Yeah. yeah that's awesome. yeah. Yeah, I also want to mention that me and Yvonne have become like buddies through Instagram, which is kind of cool. So uh, yeah. like we were, we were talking about this project was like last week or something like that. So and like that's, you know, even if it's not really the thing that you're trying to like, like the, you know, your, your exit goal or whatever it is, it, it still is kind of like a step in the right direction where it just kind of just like gives you something else in your portfolio or whatever and, and try to like uh, get to the next stage. So yeah. that's good. Yeah. Okay. Should I go to that next question or I don't know? I think uh, Alison has a question, right? Yeah. Okay. So the question is, what is your dream job? Where do you want to be in five to 10 years? This is a tough question to answer, to be honest with you. Um, Cause you can kind of see that, you know, my trajectory is basically kind of um, it's not that I don't have plans or anything like that, but it's just kind of, um, I, uh, I think I'm more adaptable if anything, like I don't, cause I, I guess like in five to 10 years, if, if I don't, like if I fall short of a specific goal, but I find a better one or something like that, I feel like I'll be changing a lot. Um, but I think that like, I think um, in terms of where I would like to be, I think I, I hope that I would still be in UX because um, I mean, I, I've seen other disciplines and things like that. I think I really do like um, the design world, the UX world. Um, but I like the idea of, um, you know, um, um, uh, like mentoring a team and things like that. So I would probably be along the lines of like teaching experience and things like that. So, but I'm not entirely sure where that would be. Okay. Let me ask you, John, John, are you able to mentor in, in, in the US? Are you able, are you willing to do that? Uh, yeah, I can do that. Okay. Just to know that if people, if people are looking for men mentorship or that's good to know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm on the discord too. So if you just like, you know, send me a message or something like that, I could, you know, help or whatever. Yeah. I put the, the link before for each, for, for the discord. So you can join there. And okay. let me ask another, another person. Todd. There's you... another question, Leticia. Oh, oh really? Oh, sorry. Yes. Sorry the... From Chennai, what is your take on portfolio website? Do you think it's necessary to have a website or a PDF version to be emailed out? Um, okay, I guess um, I guess like PDFs do work, um, but I think that like it it kind of adds an extra step in the process where you know if let's say I'm a, I'm a hiring manager and I um, you know would I prefer if I had two identical candidates. And the first candidate is basically just like, there's a link to a portfolio website. It's like, okay, one button, I'm there. Um, then there's the, the PDF person where you basically have to click, you know, click on the PDF, then download the PDF, then open the PDF. Um, so I think that like PDFs do work, but, um, and also then if I wanted to send that to uh, like the other team members or something like that, it, it kind of uh, adds an extra step. So I would say like, if you can, I would say that websites are better. Um, it doesn't really matter where your website is. Um, so like, for example, you know, uh, you could have a UX folio site like Liz does, or you could have like a Squarespace or a Wix site or something like that. You could do Webflow, like things, there's a lot of different ways to make a website. Um, and you could, you could have free websites versus, you know, uh, like paid websites, things like that. Um, but I think that th there is kind of, um, a more ease of use in terms of using a website versus a, a PDF. Um, I can't really tell you why, but um, I, I feel like um, the the sentiment that I get from PDFs is that it's kind of a little bit of an outdated way to share your stuff. 
Um, because, you know, portfolios used to be like physical things that you carried around and things like that. So, um, but I would say if you can have both, that would be the ideal. Yeah. Uh, me, okay. I can I put uh, just, just an advice for, for that question. Uh, in my concern, my experience, uh, website is better to have for, as a portfolio since you can put analytics in that and you can analyze how, how is the behavior of the users? So is, is there going to the about me? You have to improve, improve that. Where the people are losing the, the track of your website as well. What is happening um, in the entire case study you, are, you, are, you have or yeah, to every single page you have in your website. So uh, this is the other thing. So I, you have another question, I think, right, Jonathan? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll read it. Um, yeah, that, that's a really good insight, though, uh, Leticia. Um, so Diane's looking for a mentor. I could totally help out with that. Uh, Jasmine says, can you provide personal feedback on a portfolio? Uh, definitely. I could definitely do that. Um, just send it to me, and I could definitely check it out and help with that. Uh, Sebastian says, how bad is uh, open in a new tab PDF? Um, I mean, like, yeah, I guess like, you know, like let's, you should mention with the, with the analytics that that's one thing. And also just the fact that like, um, I, I guess if you are in a PDF, um, if buttons aren't clickable, that's another, uh, another thing that that's kind of, um, you know, a, a bit of a, like a, a roadblock where, you know, I would have to scroll down to the about section instead of basically just clicking on an about button, for example. Um, if, if you can make a PDF, you know, that has buttons that work and things like that, then it does make it a little bit better. Um, but, you know, it, it really depends on um, the, the ease of the user. And I feel like, you know, having a link that basically just says, this is where I live online is a little bit easier than, you know, here's my PDF, download it and um, et cetera, et cetera. Alina has a question, I think. Yeah. Hey, thanks for your talk. Um, I was just wondering what was the most unexpected part of your transition? Like, what were you really like, oh, wow, that was not what I was thinking was going to happen. Like, this isn't what I was like planning my five year, five years ago, what my trajectory felt or looked like, like what was the most unexpected point of your journey? Um, I guess like, I don't know, there, there, there's a lot of unexpected things. Um, but I think that like, um, one thing that that still kind of um, is, uh, and, and actually, th this is this is something that could kind of help uh, you guys out uh, when you are talking to recruiters and stuff like that. But a lot of times, recruiters don't really, um, or I shouldn't even just say recruiters, but just a lot of different types of people um, that work at companies, they don't really understand what UX is. So if 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 you kind of say that, like, oh, I'm a developer, or I'm a software developer, it's it's very easy to kind of um, say, okay, you have this many years of Python or React or whatever. And that means that you are probably good enough to do this job. But React uh, with UX, it's kind of different. And sometimes, you know, uh, recruiters will come to you and they'll say something like, okay, you want to be a UX uh, designer. How many years of uh, JavaScript do you have? And that right there will be kind of like a red flag for me because, you know, design and development are different things. Um, so, you know, it, it like, and I, I get questions like that all the time, even though I guess my resume does have like, you know, coding experience and stuff like that. But, um, I think that you can use that to your, your advantage because a lot of times the first, maybe even couple interviews might be with people that don't really understand what UX is. So as long as that you have a basic understanding of, you know, how to do a process and have some work to show for, you could be, you know, move, you could move along to future rounds and things like that. Um, and then, you know, eventually you get to kind of like the team. Um, but by that time, it's kind of like, you know, they've, they've basically gotten rid of a, a lot of candidates that don't really have the experience that you might have, basically. Okay. Uh, let's see. So I'll go to the next question. Um, also, Liz has a free month premium plan for UX Folio. So definitely check that out. Uh, okay. So UI, uh, this is from Daryl and he says, uh, UI design is my favorite aspect of UX. Does it make sense for me to have a separate UI portfolio in addition to my UX portfolio? Um, I would say, uh, 
Not necessarily, but I think that what you could do is have something like uh, Behance or Dribble or Awards, one of those um, sites that basically just, just focus on the visual stuff. Um, I think that probably if you're mainly focusing on UI, that may even be more important. Um, I think that like the, the portfolio that lives on, you know, Daryl.com or wherever you're going to put it, um, that's mainly important um, as like your domain. Um, but uh, it, it's more important for someone like a, a researcher because then you could kind of put case studies that like list out your process and things like that. For a UI person, um, sure, like I think it's important, but it's not as important. Okay, thanks. Sure. Good point. I think we, we can jump in it, in it. If everybody, if anyone has a question, just let me know. Raise the hand in the icon here, or we can jump in the talk. Hello, you wanted to talk, talk? Yeah, hi okay. there. Um, yeah, thanks for the presentation, Jonathan and sure. Leticia for putting this together. Uh, I was just wondering, I'm still just kind of in the exploratory uh, phase of this, of exploring UX design as a career, and it's um, something I kind of heard about about four or five years ago, and uh, it was really kind of intriguing to me, and um, I've had kind of a range of careers. Uh, I'm actually a, an elementary school teacher at the moment and been doing that for about five years. And before that, I did work in branding and brand strategy for a company for a while. And anyway, I'm looking at sort of taking some of my experiences and potentially moving into UX design and learning more about it. Um, but I was just curious what your thoughts, I, I, what your thoughts were on, um, I've heard that there, uh, to be a successful UX designer, there's going to be more of an emphasis on knowing a bit more about say the the company like depending on if you're uh, with a company or say not an agency but if you're with a company um to know a little bit more about their business uh product strategy um just the entire sort of business model of where they're going with this product versus just the specific design of the you know the visual design and and, and all that i was just wondering how in depth your knowledge needs to be um uh when you're you know with a, a specific company uh, yeah, it's a really good question. Yeah, I think that like it, it kind of goes back to the whole like the T-shaped uh, skills and, and things like that. Like you, if you are going into a company and you don't know what problem that the company is trying to solve, then you're in trouble, right? Like it's 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 not just about basically you know how can you design something that looks nice, but you kind of have to know um, you know what is the goal that the company is trying to do, or if they're trying to hire you for a specific product for the company. Um, like what problem is that product supposed to solve? Um, because like that, uh, that more or less is more important. Um, I think that like most designers, um, can, you know, go into a program and make something that looks nice. Um, like there's, you know, laws of UX and things like that, that people can follow and things like that. But I think that the more important thing is, is kind of understanding business goals that are trying to be solved. Um, if you ever seen, there's, there's like this Venn diagram, um, with three circles and one of the circles is user needs and then another one is business goals and the third one is like uh, technical constraints and basically UX is right in the middle of those three things um, mm -hmm. so if you like yes you have to please the user and um, yes you're going to be constrained by time or money or like number of people working on a product um, but you can't forget the business goals um, and you have to understand the business goals because um, those are the things that are going to make the company money. Um, so yeah, I, I think that like, it is kind of important. To, uh, the, the fact that you have a background in like branding and things like that, that's important. And that's something that you could definitely use for future jobs and things like that. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. I also like the, the, your teaching experience is also important too, because, um, a lot of times what designers have to do is explain things to non-designers. And I think that like teaching does play a role in that for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Thank you. I, I think in the last uh, meeting with uh, Ashram Havel, we had a great topic about that. You can look and see that talk if you want. Uh, it's about how designers ha has to work with developers as business at the same time and handle a lot of problems, budget problems, time problems, and stuff like that to be success, yeah, successful in the, in the Design part. So, yeah, awesome. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. So, guys, uh, we can jump five minutes, ten minutes in, in a break of rooms. Yes, you want?
So have some net network in the, so see you around. Oh wow, there's breakout rooms. Yeah, breakout rooms. <laughs>